Hey everyone, my name is Katie Edwards. I'm the senior medical provider here at Trident. And today we're gonna to talk about sleep. So it's something we all do, and yet most of us struggle with at some point in our lives. Now it may be a random night here and there, it may be more nights than not, or it may be every single night there's difficulty falling or staying asleep. So why? The goal of this presentation is to discuss what sleep is, how our body does it, and why it changes. So even Webster has a hard time with sleep. When you look at the definition, there's so much ambiguity and nebulousness in the definition of sleep that it's almost a wonder that we all can do it as well as we do. When you look at this, a condition of the body and mind, such as that which typically recurs for several hours, maybe one, maybe more, every night, in which the nervous system is relatively inactive, the eyes closed, the postural muscles relaxed, and consciousness is practically suspended. So those ambiguous words there really contribute to the overall difficulty that sleep sometimes entails. So how do we sleep? Our body is built around what's called a circadian rhythm, and that's directly related to the sun. So as the sun comes up, in theory we wake up, we go on with our day, and as the sun starts to go down, our body should transition into our sleep. The problem is, is thanks to technology and electricity and TVs, we now have more stimulation later and later past the point where the sun goes down that our body intrinsically is actually programmed differently in how it relates to sleep. So a typical sleep cycle should ideally be eight hours. Now, there's a lot of mixed reviews on that and studies that show that the eight hour rule may not hold as true as we once thought, but for the point of this presentation, we'll stick with that. So if you look at this, you'll notice our body goes in and out of REM sleep, and REM sleep is what we call rapid eye movement. That's where our body really is in its most restorative state. When you look at the graph in the representation, you'll see between the hours of 2 and 4 a.m., our body is in that deep restful sleep that also correlates to when our body's growth hormone is produced. And I want you to hang on to that because we're going to touch base on that in a minute um, to make this make a little bit more sense. We all know what it feels like to not get a good night's sleep, but what is it actually doing to our body? Lack of sleep can contribute, obviously, to decrease energy throughout the daytime, but it also prevents our body's ability to recover. It decreases our metabolism. It contributes to pretty terrible moods and it inhibits our body's ability to focus on mental clarity. An important aspect in determining why and how we're not sleeping well is what's called a sleep journal. And it's as simple as it sounds. Answering these questions throughout the night if you wake up and then the next morning can help you and your provider to be able to figure out what the source of your sleep issue is. So things to think about. Do you struggle, struggle to fall asleep, stay asleep, or both? How long does it normally take you to fall back asleep when you wake up? What makes you not fall asleep or cause you to wake up in the middle of the night? How do you feel when you have to wake up in the morning? Are you well rested or do you feel like you could keep sleeping? How does your day feel when you've not slept well? And have your sleep patterns changed? So thinking about these again can help to correlate the source of the sleep problem. So when I ask my patients these questions and ask them why they have trouble either falling or staying asleep, the answers are very similar across the board. So excluding external factors, meaning not your kid crying in the middle of the night or your phone going off or the doorbell ringing, these are the things that most people say contribute to their trouble sleeping. So the falling asleep, hands down the most common, is the mind and thoughts. So thinking about what you did today, what you have to do tomorrow, what you have to do next week, that's one of the big factors. Pain or discomfort, and then no real reason. Trouble staying asleep a lot of times has to do with temperature, and now again, not external temperature, but internal temperature changes. Hunger, and again, no real reason. Sleep hygiene is the practice of practicing good sleep. So much like you bathe and brush your teeth and have a routine when it comes to that hygiene, sleep hygiene has a similar backbone. So the things to think about in order to help improve your sleep, exercise early in the day. So increasing your body's serotonin will help to improve your sleep at night, but not if you do it right before you're trying to sleep. You wanna make sure you're well hydrated. 
So drinking at least 64 ounces of water daily will help to promote a deeper sleep. Sunshine is fantastic. Vitamin D is one of the vitamins we know that can help promote our body's ability to get into that circadian rhythm and fall asleep naturally. And stretching. Stretching reduces and releases lactic acid, which then helps our body to get into a deeper, more restful sleep quicker. The things you don't want to do. Try not to nap during the daytime. Especially later in the day, this is going to, again, throw off that circadian rhythm. You should never use nicotine, but if you do, using it or caffeine later in the day acts as a stimulant, so that's going to make it harder to fall asleep. Don't eat your me big meal later in the day. Your body's focused on trying to digest and metabolize the food, not on going to bed. And avoid anything with a screen. TVs, phones, laptops, all of that white light has an effect, again, on the way that the body can focus on getting into the circadian sleep. So put them away. So let's say you do all of that. You practice the good sleep hygiene, you're avoiding the bad stuff, you've kept your sleep journal, and you're still struggling. There definitely can be internal factors that contribute to our body's poor sleep. So hormonal imbalance is one of the big ones. I won't touch too much on that because I've done that in, in great detail in my other presentations. So take a look at those if you're interested in learning more about the hormonal imbalance. Elevated homocysteine level, which is one of the stress hormones can contribute to poor sleep, low vitamin D, and a high sex hormone binding globulin. So let's touch on those to make those make a little bit more sense. Like I said, homocysteine is one of our body's stress hormones, specifically our emotional stress hormone. So homocysteine levels are gonna rise when our body senses that we have an emotional stress, typically secondary to friends, family, finance, work, travel. So as you can imagine, most of us have elevated homocysteine levels. When our levels are significantly elevated, homocysteine can actually have a physical manifestation on our body. Primarily, it shows as increased plaque in the arteries that go to the heart, which is why we say stress can kill you, because it can. At lower levels, homocysteine can prevent our body from being able to get a deep, restful sleep because our body is focused on trying to find the stressor. It can't understand that the emotional stress is not a tangible stress, and so it's constantly on high alert. This prevents our body from getting good rest, from having energy through the daytime, prevents metabolism and mental focus. So the way that we can help our body to internally fight off this stress is with B-complex vitamins. So B vitamins actually bind to the homocysteine. Anything that's bound in our body, our body doesn't want to use, so it just gets rid of it. Decreasing the homocysteine can help significantly with our body's ability to sleep. Growth hormone is a significant culprit when it comes to trouble sleeping, specifically staying asleep. So naturally our body's growth hormone spikes between about two and 4 a.m. That spike, again, if you go back to that chart we looked at in the beginning part of the presentation, is when our body in theory should be in REM sleep. So the spike and our REM sleep cycles are directly tied together. So when our growth hormone levels start to decrease the older we get, our body just naturally can't get into REM sleep as efficiently as it once could. This then prevents the body from being able to repair, recover, and prevents our metabolism from functioning as efficiently. Sex hormone binding globulins are a major contributor when we talk about our body's ability to utilize hormones. So basically what these little globulins are, are these little proteins that float around in the body, and they love to bind to sex hormones. So normally they exist, they're floating around, and if they see sex hormones, they bind to it. Again, if it's bound in our body, our body can't use it. So when the sex hormone binding globulin binds up all of our sex hormones, mostly testosterone and estrogen, it prevents our body's ability to use them. So certain things that aggravate this are age, can't really control that, stress, if you can control it, let me know how, increased body fat, and high estrogen relative to your other hormones, so mostly testosterone in guys and progesterone in ladies. So affecting and correlating these can decrease the sex hormone binding globulin and help the body to function more efficiently. So let's take a look at what's going on. There may be external factors that are contributing. There may also be these internal factors that contribute to the body's poor sleep. So by checking your labs, we can get a better idea and a blueprint of how we can go ahead and attack the sleep issue. After you get your labs done, you'll come in, speak with one of our providers, and they'll create a custom therapy plan for you. 
So please feel free to give us a call. Office phone number is 954-451-5454, or you can visit us on our website at www.tridentantiaging.com. Also, please note, we do accept your HSA and FSA cards. Thanks for listening today. Take care.